Congress Part 2. Here in the second part, I want to focus on two issues, representation of women and minorities in Congress and the complex obstacle course of legislation. Women comprise more than 50% of the population, yet in the House, there are about 19% women in the Senate, 20 senators, female senators, 20%. Latino citizens account for about 17% of the population. In the House, 7% of elected representatives are Latino. African Americans comprise about 13% of the population. Again, a similar pattern, they are underrepresented in the House. Currently, there are three senators who are African Americans. Two of them, however, were not elected but appointed by governors to fill vacant seats. Only one, Cory Booker from New Jersey, was able to win a statewide election. How does this compare to other countries? These numbers only become meaningful when we look at it in a more comparative pattern that tells us, is this a lot or is this very little in terms of female representation? The table here is the most updated table I could find in terms of female representation, focus on the upper house, that would be the equivalent of the Senate. Some countries, on the other hand, are unicameral, not bicameral, and, might not, and do not have an upper house or a Senate. You see on this table that there are Several countries, actually one country in the 50s, Rwanda, several countries in the 40s, Sweden, Finland, South Africa, Nicaragua, Iceland, Norway, uh, Mozambique, many countries in the 30s in terms of female representation. Many countries, I am just scrolling down this list, in the 20s. And here, number 79, tied with Albania, the United States female representation rates. They're a bit higher now, uh, but other countries have increased as well, so this should not impact the overall ranking 79 tied with Albania. You might wonder what countries rank lowest in terms of female representation. Not surprisingly, some of the Arab countries, Palau, Qatar, uh, have 0% female representation, Lebanon, 3.1%, Iran, 3.1%, Kuwait, 6.2%. So typically, more countries with more traditional gender roles rank lower in terms of female representation. Again, to sum up, the United States ranks 79th worldwide in terms of female representation. What factors account for the underrepresentation of women? There are three factors I want to highlight. First of all, recruitment. Politicians typically come from a narrow range of professions, law, a legal career, is actually the most frequent occupation of a member of Congress. Traditionally, women have been underrepresented in these professions. Though this is changing today, women are more likely to go to law school than men. Also, female office seekers are slightly older than male office seekers when they first run for office. Second, let's talk about psychological factors, stereotypes. Please have a look at the table below. These entries show you the percentage of the public believing that either men or women would do a better job 
in these specific areas directing the military, making war decisions, these type of things. You see that these numbers do not add up to 100. The remaining percentages are those people who say it doesn't make a difference whether a man or a woman would do the job. Can you see some kind of pattern in these numbers? Directing the military, conducting diplomatic relationships with other countries, making war decisions. In those three areas, the public generally believes that women would do a worse job than men. Directing the military, 50% believe that women would do a worse job than men. On the other hand, look at Look, the last four issue areas, assisting the poor, improving education, protecting the environment, assisting senior citizens, in those areas, women actually outperform men. This coincides rather neatly with traditional and stereotypic gender roles. Women are more caring, they're good at taking care of their family, and by extension must be good at taking care for the nation. On the other hand, when it comes to foreign policy, diplomacy, military, areas that traditionally have been extremely important in the United States, especially in terms of electing the executive, in these kind of areas, women are not perceived to be as competent, as capable as men. So traditional gender roles continue to influence how the public looks at elected representatives. Third reason is an institutional reason, incumbency. In a typical election, well over 90% of House members and usually over 70% of senators seeking re-election succeed in doing so. Some representatives serve for many years. Strom Thurmond from South Carolina, for instance, served for 48 years and retired from the Senate in 2003 at age 99. Why do incumbents have, name, have advantages? There are many reasons. Incumbents have name recognition. They typically raise more campaign funds than non-incumbents, usually able to raise three times the amount of money than challengers do. And they need less money because they already have name recognition. Incumbents have institutional benefits. They have the resources of their office, staff, time, travel funds, and even mailing privileges. They can send out any piece of mail without being charged for this to tend to the, the needs of their constituents. Incumbents are typically the more senior members of Congress and can use their position to advance their district or their state. Some people argue that the number of terms a member of Congress can serve should be limited the way they are limited for the presidency, maybe to two terms. This would amount to 12 years for the Senate. Maybe six terms, another 12 years for House members. Think about it. Are you in favor of term limits? So three reasons. Incumbency, recruitment, psychological reasons. All three of them account, continue to account for the underrepresentation of women. Next, very briefly, one could devote an entire semester to this. I want to look at the legislative obstacle course. What you see here is an abbreviated version of a very, very complex legislative obstacle course. First, you need to know that the Senate and the House are organized along committees. Senate and House each have about 25 committees. Think about these committees as mini-legislatures. 
after a bill is introduced in the House, for instance, it is immediately referred to a committee and to a subcommittee. Also, remember that we have a bicameral Congress, Senate and House. For legislation to pass, it has to pass in both institutions. Not necessarily simultaneously, but it has to go through the Senate and through the House. So assume our bill, maybe an immigration bill, is introduced in the Senate, in the House. It is considered by a committee, by a subcommittee. This is where interest groups and lobbyists have a lot of influence because here they have direct contact with the lawmakers. More often than not, the bill dies at the committee stage, either subcommittee or committee, and never makes it to the full floor of the House. Assume our bill makes it to the floor debate, House and Senate, then it gets even more complicated. Also keep in mind that Senate and House procedures were almost the same up to this point. Once we get to the floor debate, it gets a little bit different. Debate on the floor in the House is often not very exciting, um, often rather predictable because many House members vote along party lines. Rules, rules for debate in the Senate are However, a bit more complicated, this brings us to the filibuster. Debate in the Senate cannot be limited and does not need to be related to the issue being discussed. What happens more and more is the Senate filibuster. A minority party, as long as it has more than 40 senators, can filibuster a bill, which means that they, can, theoretically at least, continue to talk and talk and talk, and this repeated and prolonged talking would prevent the Senate from going on with its business. In reality, however, nowadays at least, the actual talking doesn't take place anymore, just the threat of a filibuster is typically sufficient in persuading the majority party to change parts of the bill so that it becomes acceptable to the minority party. Assume the House votes yes, assume the Senate votes yes. By this time, the versions of the bill will be completely different. House and Senate will form a conference committee to come up with a new version that incorporates the House and the Senate version. And again, it goes back to the House and the Senate so that they can vote on the newly arrived conference version. Again, this process can take multiple times and there are many possibilities for failure. If it succeeds, and the House votes yes, and the Senate votes yes, it will end up on the President's de desk, who can either sign or veto the bill. Let me go back to the filibuster and explain this a little bit more. The filibuster is a congressional privilege that takes its name from 18th century pirates who would hold people hostage for long periods of time. It's actually a good description. A filibuster holds people hostage for a long period of time. Perhaps the most significant use of the filibuster in the 20th century was in opposing civil rights legislation. Southern Democrats used the filibuster to derail civil rights litigation several times in the 50s and 60s. Strom Thurmond holds the record for the longest filibuster speaking for 24 hours and 18 minutes to block the 1957 Civil Rights Act. Debate can be limited, the filibuster can be broken,
by a process called closure. Closure requires a three-fifth vote of the Senate. So it will only happen if the majority party has a filibuster-proof majority, meaning 60 senators or more. When you observe a filibuster in action, it really does look silly. Note that I included another example I want you to look at on today's list of activities. The discussion, whatever the senator talks about, does not need to be related to the bill. It looks silly, but it is a strategic instrument a minority will use and these days, users actually very, very often in order to influence the majority or stall, prevent a certain bill from happening. Legislation is extremely complex. More often than not, nothing gets done. Think about immigration reform. Congress is talking about this for more than a decade. Nothing significant has happened. Congressional committees are extremely important in this process. This is where most of the legislative effort takes place. Really rather invisible. The public does not know what is happening in these congressional committees. Congress has elaborate rules and procedures that often delay and obstruct proposed new laws. Most of the congressional leaders, members from both parties, come from heavily partisan and safe districts and are likely to get re-elected over and over again. So in sum, lawmaking is an obstacle course. Many bills do not make it to the floor and often die at the committee level. <laughs>